My name is Anders. Um, such a room full of talent. And Volvo Cars, we are um, all about safety, right? This is why it feels very special to be in this room uh, with so many superheroes working on autonomy, AI, ADAS, and all the things that helps us to reduce road deaths and, and really save lives. 40,000 people die in the US every year on the roads alone. Uh, worldwide, it's even more. So thank you all for the efforts that you help uh, for the world. And in the competition to make the safest product, everybody's a winner. This is us. Uh, this is what we do, uh, amongst other things. We are very much about uh, automotive safety. It's in our genes, it's in our core. This is also, today I'm gonna to talk a bit about how our approach on software-defined vehicles. Still start with this video of a crash test that we do, which is based on field data that we collected. This is not a typical rating case. This is above and beyond. And the reason I do this is because for us, the, the, the embracing the software-defined vehicle as a, as a technology platform for the sake of safety alone justifies the entire effort and the entire enterprise. Um, and again, I'm gonna give a high level overview today on 20 minutes, which will not answer all questions, but our comprehensive approach to the software defined vehicles, uh, which really starts probably, we started a few years ago, but now it takes off for real. Outside I parked today an EX90 built in our South Carolina plant, uh, which will be, we're filling the pipelines right now with the first deliveries coming this month, which is our first vehicle fully based on a core compute system fully software defined. A bit more on that later. So this is a snapshot in time. This is two different products. This is the XC90, which we just launched a refresh on, and then the X90 in the same picture. This is really a snapshot of progress as well. The XC90 is probably the pinnacle of the domain-based architecture vehicle. It's a fantastic product. It's gonna be earning its position in the market for a few more years to come. Uh, it's great, these two products are gonna coexist because they're both good products at this moment in time, but they represent completely two different approaches to the vehicle. The other car in this picture, which is an EX90, is our first core computer-based platform, typically known as a software-defined vehicle. Internally, we call it core computer, same thing. While the XC90 is a battle-hardened third-generation model launched now, that survived the test and the pressure of competition of many years to become a polished diamond. The other product, the EX90, is brand new, just born, has a, it's a fantastic product in its own right where it is now, but it has enormous potential to scale. So on the XC90, I just want to show this. This is what we're launching as well. This is the only piece really bridging the two cars. What you see on the screen is the infotainment HMI that we're going to launch in the XC90. This is the same infotainment stack as we are launching on the EX90. So this is the only piece kind of bridging the new and the old. And the important statement with this, this is kind of a microcosm of the software-defined vehicle. Here, this represents in a smaller scale, really what we're trying to do with the car on a bigger scale. The infotainment stack that we're launching into these cars, and we will over the air update two and a half million cars already on the markets, all with the, the uh, AAOS and, and Google uh, Automotive Services, is the same stack, it's the same master. It's not different branches, it's the same system from the same master across several hardware revisions going all the way back to Apollo Lake across a few versions of, of uh, Snapdragons. And it's the whole idea here is the superset of software on one master to cover a wide range of hardware revisions going back in time but also future proofing so we can scale to future hardware platforms. And this bridges into the EX90, which will be the topic going forward. So again, this is just the starting point for us. This is our first car out, which is truly software defined, running at this current revision on a double Orient setup with full ISO 26262 compliance. Fantastic platform. Uh, and it's been a hard journey. It's been a hill to climb. We have to admit that, but it's a hill we don't need to climb again. So, this marks our 
really launch into the fully software defined vehicle. It's a radically different product under the hood from the XC90. And our whole relationship, to, and I think Doug Fields alluded to it well as, as well in, in the conversation this morning, our whole relationship as an engineering organization, but also as a company to the product, product will change over time. The transition to a software defined vehicle is not something you do within software engineering or engineering as a whole. It's a company wide change process. We're in this constant state of disruption. All the geopolitics, uh, different coexisting technology revolutions, transition to BEV, the computerization of the car, all happens to coexist. And I'm going to present in the next few slides kind of our way to create some level of stability and a philosophy around the product um, that helps us to sort out where we're going. So truly software defined. But first look out, take, let's zoom out a bit to look at the context where, where, where the transition of the car as a product is going. Over the last hundred years or so, the car has been moving around, roaming around, if you will, in the society without any communication to the world. It's been a free object, no connection to the world, occupying some 20-25% of public space, but really no connection to the world, into becoming this fully integrable entity into society, into to every single aspect of, of, of infrastructure, energy grid systems, traffic systems, road systems. At the same time, the product is also becoming fully integrated into itself, meaning we can read every sensor, we can send new instructions to every actuator, and we can kind of scale every dimension. This is the, really the case for the software-defined vehicles. The trad traditional domain-based architectures, we kind of reach peak, peak functionality. To, to realize more functionality, you need to add more complexity. We needed to do something radically different to keep on growing and be able to combine different capabilities to create new functionalities. But again, it's, not, it's so much more than software. It's not only something you ask the software community to do. So I'm going to go through very high level our approach and how we're thinking about vehicle uh, transitioning really vehicle architectures into a technology stack. So highest level, absolutely highest level on our technology roadmaps and te technology portfolios. We have the vehicle architecture up to your right. You cannot separate that from the software defined vehicle your scalability, the sizes, and how you actually design all your load paths, that needs to be considered as well, because you're gonna to need to do bottom left, compute, electronics, electrical distribution in that architecture. You need to obsessively integrate those two together. Top left, you have your propulsion and energy, your battery, your power electronics, needs to be integrated into all this, obviously also run on software. And then bottom right, at the end of the day, you have your software stack. And exactly what, what Doug Phil said this morning as well, software needs to be on top of every consideration. This is the big difference between the old, we, we, the car industry, we've done vehicle architectures, platforms for 30 years, 30 plus years. So much of this is the same, that doesn't go away, but the introduction of software on top of everything changes, it changes the whole concept of the platform radically. So if we look at, for instance, scalable vehicle architecture, First, it's not like necessarily directly connected to the software, but it's part of our holistic approach to software-defined vehicles. The scalability we want to create. The importance of this is because you will not be able to afford to be on multiple stacks. You need to create a scalable architecture to build all the products that you want to build over time, or you think you want to build over time, up front, and make sure you design that to be run on one software stack. Otherwise, you're creating different ecosystems from the get-go. The moment you start scatter your efforts, you need to do everything twice, or three times, or four times. You want to be able to converge all your engineering efforts into one technology stack. This is why we need to have the scalable architecture first. The second is the propulsion and energy roadmaps. So all your drive units, battery management system, battery pack, etc that whole roadmap needs to be under the same umbrella of one single technology stack. Of course, we will develop, we will obsessively develop, 
Generation 1 motors already out of production, some 85% efficiency. Gen 2 now in production, 91% efficiency, cheaper, better, lighter, less CO2. Third generation launching soon. Again, cheaper, better, lighter, obsessively integrated part of the technology stack. Same with battery packs. It's not one battery pack, obviously. You need a set portfolio of variants, chemistries, range positions, but it needs to be defined up front because you need, you need to know what you dimension the machine for. Electronics and compute. So here we are starting with the EX90. We will have a strictly evolutionary approach on everything that goes on the electrical system. There's no more big bangs. There's no more white piece of paper and start from scratch. Everything will be evolutionary approach. Otherwise, we leave the tech stack, which we can't do. So step by step, gradual, careful hardware updates, carefully planned in time, uh, never together, uh, to lay them out in a way we can gradually improve every single aspect of the tech stack to support all the cars we are building, and piece by piece, always improve, embrace technology to make higher performance, lower cost all the time. And finally then, on one track software. This is kind of where the biggest change is. Software needs to be on top of every single consideration you have as an engineering organization. Software and protecting of the stack becomes a primary objective of the engineering organization. Two things we do is continuously and relentlessly improve every aspect of the technology stack and protect the integrity of the stack. So Doug Field mentioned before the power balance, for instance, in an OEM between programs and vehicle line management versus engineering. That discussion is done and does still at, at Volvo Cars to really have everybody working together, planning the product side by side with the technology stack and the software stack together uh, to make sure that we have a clean and clear cadence. From that perspective, the cycle plan or the product launch cadence is seen as only vessels to launch the new technology or technology improvements into production. So again, starting from the EX90, all our, our products will be based on one tech stack. Uh, it contains vehicle architecture, contains propulsion and energy roadmap, contains electronics and electrics and compute roadmap, all under the umbrella of one tech stack. We call this a superset tech stack to continue to develop the superset of mechanical, electrical and compute capabilities all under the umbrella of one software stack that continuously improves and encompasses an even bigger bandwidth or improved bandwidth of wider vehicle capabilities. And this is the primary reason for us to do this. I could take the case of vehicle safety where I started. Being a vehicle safety company at our core, we have always gone above and beyond, beyond the stars, if you may, when it comes to achieving road safety and crash safety in every aspect. Since the 1970s, we had our own crash research team. They've been out collecting 50,000 accidents on site involving over 80,000 uh, occupants. In the beginning, in the early days, measuring tapes, assessing the scene, looking at skid marks, looking at police reports, very manual, obviously getting more advanced as, as technology progresses, uh, being able to pull logs from the ODB2 port. Now we're pulling some information over the air, um, crash logs, etc. With, we have all the processes, all the people, all the skills to analyze and comprehend and, and digest this data we get from the real world. We have even behavioralists to understand the human being because our philosophy is design cars for humans because we're not perfect. We all make mistakes, we're all tired, we're all distracted at times. We're gonna equip that whole activity now with the superpower of real world, real time insight, closed loop development, and the ability to improve every aspect of the car in the fleet now by using software to influence sensors and actuators, but also educate us on what did we miss? What else can we do? What crash load cases did we do? What driver behaviors didn't we see? And continuously form us how to develop our hardware roadmap, our sensing roadmap, etc. Just this aspect alone 
justifies all the investments and all the hard work we put into getting to where we are today, where we can say now we're launching the first truly software-defined car. And, and again, I told, talked to some of the colleagues here from Applied Intuition before. From this point on, we have all the time in the world because now we are working on perfecting, improving relentlessly every single aspect of our tech stack. Growing, expanding capabilities, being super disciplined about it, but now we never start from scratch again. Um, and endless integration. I'm not going to go super deep. This is kind of wrapping it up for me. I'm not going to go super deep into this because this is not technically part of the tech stack. But as I said before, going from a product which has been isolated from the world to something which is endlessly integratable into society, we, our approach on ADADAS at Volvo Cars is we're on a journey towards zero. And our, our trajectory or our philosophy is we're on a path towards zero, which obviously implies full self-driving because you cannot have zero with a human involved. But we are going to do it through safe automation. And for us, the journey is what's important because we will be able to continuously, together with a lot of you in this room, continuously reduce accidents, incidents on the road and make the world a safer and a more sustainable place. <laughs>